we were just joking around that I should give a speech about understanding British women, but instead I decided I'd talk about something I do understand. So I'm here to talk about why everyone should think like an activist. My name is Daniel. I'm an activist, and so are all of you. But more on that in a moment. I don't know if you've noticed, but something really strange has happened these past few years. All of a sudden, activists are everywhere. Activists are being celebrated. Activists are cool. And I have to say, that kind of came out of nowhere. My mom knows who Malala is, my postman knows what happened in Tahrir Square, and the response to Trayvon Martin's killing resonated around the world. But it wasn't that long ago that activists and our activism were perceived to be as anything but mainstream or cool, rather almost universally maligned as representing marginal or fringe factions, and as a result, not really listened to or valued by the mainstream. So, as I've been thinking about why this happened, a couple things came to mind. I'd like to share them with you today. Um, I'd like to take us back first to this definition of what an activist is. I've, mo I've moved that an activist is anyone, anywhere, working to affect change. And I think that's something very different than what we traditionally think of as activism. As a result of this, I think we can all agree that we are all activists working to affect change. Now that change can be global, that can be about global warming and nuclear proliferation. It can be national, like marriage equality or education curriculum. That change can be local, like zoning regulations or public health. But that change can also be very personal. It can be about what's happening in our communities, in our neighborhoods, our families and our relationships, our jobs and our careers, our hopes and our changes, our addictions and our losses. Change can be about whatever we want it to be. And as we all try and affect change on our own level, I think it's really important that we think about how we do so. Life's really hard, life's very challenging. No matter what type of change we're trying to affect, I think we can all agree it'd be better if we could be a little more effective in affecting that change. So today I'd like to think through a couple ways we can do that. Now, I've been an activist a really long time. I started working on local issues in my local community as a high school student, and later as a university student on national and international issues I was passionate about. Afterwards, I moved to Washington, D.C. and became a full-time professional activist. At the time, I was working to build and leverage a global grassroots to influence policymakers in Washington. I've since left activism full-time. Originally, I moved to a startup and into the private sector. But all these years later, I realized I still define myself as an activist, and more than that, I still think like an activist. And it's this activist thinking that I've used in so many random projects since leaving activism. I've applied my activist thinking to projects as wide and ranging as demystifying meditation in the West, building Harry Potter's online community, designing an early warning system for rape in the Congo, and so on and so forth. Things that we would never normally associate with activism and all the societal stereotypes that go along with it. So today I'd like to talk for a moment about what defines activist thinking with the idea being that we can all apply this activist thinking in our own lives as we try and create our own change, whether that's change in our backyard or across an ocean. So three things define activist thinking. The first is that a good, or good ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. The second, is that getting someone's attention is as important as what you do with it. And finally, the third, affecting change requires engaging a variety of stakeholders. Let's break these down. So the first, good ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. Traditionally, when we're looking for a good idea or trying to solve a problem, we ask those closest to us. People ask their friends and family, businesses ask their boards and executives, and governments ask their elected representatives and appointed officials. But part of activist thinking is defined by recognizing that sometimes it's those who aren't so familiar with the issue at hand that can present the best ideas. Crowdsourcing, or the idea that from a large crowd an anonymous or otherwise unknown person might have the solution, is a great example of this. And the first successful example of crowdsourcing on a significant scale happened here in London in 1714, when the British government was trying to solve what it called the longitude problem. 
First, a bit of context. To know where you are on a map, you need two data points. You need your latitude and your longitude. Now, the beginning of the 1700s, by then, sailors had figured out more or less how to measure their latitude or their north-south position using a sextant, a way of measuring uh, the sun's height. It wasn't very accurate, but compared to how they could measure their longitude, which boiled down to no more than a best guess at the time, um, latitude was much more uh, relevant and predictable. So at the time, beginning of the 18th century, seafaring saw an enormous explosion as European powers took the seas like never before. And as sailors were sailing further and further from shore, they knew less and less where they actually were. As a result, thousands of sailors drowned as their ships and sometimes even whole fleets sank when they um, sailed into perilous waters and didn't know where they were. Seeking innovation, the British government created this prize called the Launch 2 Prize. It was a £20,000 cash prize, which in today's money is almost £3.5 million. Pounds. The funny thing was, they thought that the prize or the, the challenge would be unsolvable because up until this time, all the great men of science in Europe had been trying and failing to come up with a way to measure longitude. But lo and behold, in 1765, a rural, self-educated man named John Harrison, who was the son of a carpenter in England, solved the prize. He came up with a clock that could withstand sailing on the high seas while still keeping extremely accurate time. And this was exactly what sailors needed to help them measure their longitude. So it's funny because this is a man who never would have been asked for his opinion, and in fact wasn't even considered to be someone who might have any tactical understanding of the problem, yet alone the solution. But because the British government, thinking like activists, extended the question to all of society at the time, they were able to crowdsource a solution, proving the point that good ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. I think that's something we can all take to heart in our own lives, even if we're not trying to figure out navigation. Um, because so often we do just go to those surrounded, to surround us, and let's be honest, they're probably great, wonderful, and smart people. But we know a lot more people, and through technology can reach even more. And oftentimes I think great solutions can come from those as well. Now the second point is that getting someone's attention is as important as what you do with it. Today, traditionally, when people or a company or a cause wants to get someone's attention, they do so through traditional engagement mediums. They take out an advertisement, they pick up the phone, they send an email, maybe if they're really ambitious, they'll knock on your door or rent one of those skywriting planes. Activists, though, traditionally, are a little more resource scarce and have to be a little scrappier, a little more creative to get people's attention, particularly on issues they might not otherwise be interested in or opt into. Now, there's lots of different examples that come to mind, but one that immediately came to mind for me when I was thinking about this was the pursuit of love. This is something that our society, we so celebrate, people who put themselves out there, and oftentimes, it's about getting someone's attention to begin with. So the movie reference that came to mind was John Cusack's character in the 80s film, Say Anything. It's early morning, he's standing outside his sweetheart's window, trench coat fluttering in the breeze, arms raised overhead, boombox blasting Peter Gabriel's Say Anything. His character letting this woman know that he wasn't going anywhere. He gets the, the woman in the end, and I think the obvious lesson to draw here, besides the fact that it would appear some women are really into trench coats, <laughs> is that how you get someone's attention can make a huge difference on the results that you get. But that it's not just about how you get their attention, it's what you do with it. And as an activist, I'd say I'm less interested in getting someone's attention than in moving them, inspiring them to action. Because if our goal as an activist is to effect change, to do so, we need people to take action on any level. Now, an excellent example of this comes from Tunisia in 2011. The Arab, what became known as the Arab Spring had just occurred in Tunisia. They rid themselves of their longtime dictator, President Ben Ali, and the first elections in a generation were quickly approaching. Civil society, however, was very concerned that people wouldn't get out the vote, that people didn't understand that their fragile and young democracy was at stake in this election. So a brilliant campaign was hatched in which the organizers put a building-sized poster of the now deposed President Ben Ali on a building in a public square in a main city in Tunisia. Now, this poster brought up all of the baggage, all of the angst um, of the population that had just rid itself of this dictatorship. 
And that morning, as the crowd grew, so did their anger, eventually resulting in them tearing down the poster, exactly as the organizers had intended. It revealed a message, beware, dictatorship can return on October 23rd, vote. Now, this is a brilliant way of getting people, not just getting their attention, but them getting to that, then getting them to do something. And as a result of this and many other get out the vote campaigns, that election saw an 80% voter turnout in Tunisia, in which they not only carried on the legacy of the Arab Spring, but helped to instill a sense of democracy in their country. And this idea of getting someone's attention and then getting them to do something with it is something that I think we all can do a better job of thinking about when we're trying to affect change in our own lives. It's not enough just to raise awareness, but we need to give people specific paths of action to take so they can help us to affect change. Now the final point that defines activist thinking is that affecting change requires engaging a variety of stakeholders. It's a way too fancy way of saying that there's not a one-stop shop, a silver bullet, a big red button labeled change anymore that we can just push and voila, whatever we're looking for happens. The reality is that we need to engage a wide variety of stakeholders to create change in our lives. Whether that's you know, around our kitchen table or something globally. Now, someone who knew this better than almost anyone was the father of nonviolent activism, Mahatma Gandhi. The example I'll share with you, I think, elucidates this perfectly. In 1930, the British colonial government in India enacted what was a very draconian law called, that was a tax on salt. It effectively taxed any local producer of salt. And this was a law that struck to the very heart of Indian society because everyone needs salt to survive, young, old, rich, poor. So Gandhi set out on a march from his ashram near Ahmedabad to the beaches of Dandi on the coast in which they would be protesting this new salt law and resulting in them making salt on the beach of Dandi. Now, what started as a few followers from his ashram mushroomed into thousands and thousands of followers by the time they completed the march. And I think the point that we cannot learn from this is that those people represented all of Indian society because Gandhi understood that to create change that would affect all of India, all of Indians need to be represented in creating that change. Those followers, as he went on that march to the beach, included every strata of Indian society not just young and old, male and female, rich and poor, but Brahmin and untouchable, Hindu and Muslim. An incredible accomplishment when you consider how polarized Indian society is and was at every level. So an important lesson for us to all take to heart when we think about affecting change, even if it's just in our local neighborhood, uh, there's so many different people who can play a role in that change. And the more that you bring them into the process early on, the more effective you'll be in creating that change. So, to wrap up, my clicker's broken. There's a really great slide next. I'm sorry, you're not gonna go see it. Um, I wanna just run through these points again, but take a moment and recognize that we live in a connected world, we live in a challenging world, but we also live in a world in which at no, at no time before have individuals had more power to affect change. And I think that these three things, whether it's these three things or any other constructs or strategies to affect change, I hope that we all take into account that with a little thinking, a little strategy, and the help of our friends, we all have the power and the ability to really affect change. So again, it's good thinking can come, good ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. Getting someone's attention is as important as what you do with it. And affecting change requires engaging a variety of stakeholders. Thanks so much, good luck affecting change.